And the simple answer to that is no, I haven't. I haven't lived closely with that story. I've never been in the war zone. Uh, I have never had to be a refugee or flee from terrible, terrible danger. Um, but of course, I researched all that very thoroughly. Um, and of course, all of us are exposed to stories about, uh, about refugees, about war, about that level of human suffering all the time in the news if we choose to listen to it. Um, and I would say that although the story is, is partly invented, that I hope what it has in it is a reflection of reality, a core of truth that carries the experience of real refugees for my readers. Now, of course, that's a huge responsibility on me uh, as a writer to make sure that I make the story that I tell as, as true to the experience of the people whose voices I am representing as I possibly can. And that's an enormous moral responsibility and I know that in literature at the moment, uh, particularly children's literature, there is a lot of uh, discussion um, about cultural uh, and experiential appropriation. That writers don't have the right, some people say that writers don't have the right to steal somebody else's experience which they don't have and retell it. Now, I would absolutely, fundamentally challenge that view um, because if you can only write about your own experience well you know that's all of science fiction and historical novels out of the window and part of the role of an author in the world is to is to give voice and representation to people who don't have a voice and who don't have representation and for whatever reason um, a child, a young child who is a refugee fleeing terrible danger, perhaps with no family support, that child doesn't have a voice in the world. But I do. And so I can tell that story and hopefully, hopefully, hopefully make people listen um, and pay attention and think about what that experience would be to put the idea of imagining someone else's terrible experience into the mind of my readers. Um, so the other thing that contributed to my, to my writing it was that my father, although I've never been in the war zone, my father fought in the Second World War and he was part of the forces that liberated Belsen. Uh, and I can say that he was marked by that forever. And I think to a certain extent, we as a family absorbed some of that. So although my experience of that trauma is very, very much second-hand, I'm not completely removed from it. And actually none of us are completely removed from it because everything in the world is connected. Um, so there are all aspects of that story were carefully researched, taken from news reports, taken from um, the first-hand testimonies of refugees um, and also from a story that I heard told by a British journalist about a child who had visited uh, a French school near one of the refugee camps on the French coast and this child had asked to be admitted to the school to resume her education to regain some of that normality that children, of course, completely lose, that families and people completely lose when they're forced to flee their home and flee their country. Um, and she asked to be admitted to the school and the school said, no, there's no room for you, there's no chair for you to sit on, go away. And the child came back the next day with some broken chair that she'd found on a rubbish dump somewhere. Now, I don't know what the end of that story was, but... Um, that gave me some of the structure um, and, of course, the powerful symbol of the empty chair. And I have to say, um, one of the things that your subconscious is very, very good at doing is coming up with things that are powerful that the front of your brain has no idea about. So really, it was only when I finished writing The Day War Came that I realised 
that an empty chair, a structure shaped for a human body, is, is a really powerful symbol. So when I was writing uh, The Day War Came, there were news reports coming out of Syria, particularly Aleppo, uh, about the terrible things that were happening to the civilian population there. And um, so I think in my head, I was definitely thinking Middle East. Rebecca Cobb, who created the wonderful images to go with my story, um, I think that was also in her mind. I think you can see that reflected in the scenes that she writes about the town from which the child comes uh, and the terrible destruction um, that that family, that family suffers. But of course, you know, this stuff is happening around the world all the time. And actually, the story of refugees is very, very much the story of humankind. You know, many of us in Europe are fortunate enough to live in stable societies where we don't have anything really major to fear and hopefully we won't ever have to leave our homes in the middle of the night without dragging our kids by the hand and a handful of possessions that we've grabbed in 10 minutes while a bomb is falling. Hopefully that's not going to happen to us but that's luck. That's not because we're better or because we're superior. It's just luck and history. And at other points in history, the places where we live might have been war-torn and we too might have been refugees. And in the future too, with climate change and um, the, uh, the disruption that it's probably going to cause, refugees are going to be something much more normal and we're really going to have to learn to be much more kind and more empathic towards people who've had to leave their homes because something really terrible has happened there. It was hard for the reasons that I've explained that writing from an ex about an experience that you haven't had has to be very carefully researched and I would also say extremely carefully imagined. That's the duty of the writer. If you're going to tell somebody else's story, you really have to be sure that you're doing the right thing, that you're representing as clearly as possible what the reality is, even if what you're doing is lacing that reality together with uh, with stitches that you've that you've imagined. So that that was hard, um, and of course it was it was hard to think about those things because you know we don't want to think about that stuff. Um, but it was also incredibly rewarding too, because the response to uh, that story, which was originally published in a British newspaper, The Guardian, um, was enormous. Uh, and there was a big upwelling of, uh, of sympathy and activism um, in the UK um, around, uh, around the story and around the image of the empty chair. Uh, and when the story was eventually published with Rebecca's illustrations, um, it, uh, it was launched, the day it was launched, we worked with uh, my publishers and I uh, and Rebecca, we worked with uh, a refugee charity called Help Refugees uh, and we uh, helped to raise money for uh, for their work. And at the launch, uh, a young woman who had been a refugee in her earlier life uh, also spoke. Um, and I was very reassured by that, that what she said to me, she thanked me for writing the story and um, that was the the best reward to feel that I had in some way, in some small way, represented her experience and, and put it into the world. Now, um, I'm often asked why I write about difficult things for little children, because shouldn't little children be protected and um, not have to think about these difficult matters? Well, the fact is, that little children are exposed to difficulty and trauma all the time. Not all children are lucky enough not to be exposed to uh, the hard things in life. Um, and 
So we need structures and conversations open so that they can understand what's going on. So I feel it's incredibly important to, to write about the most difficult and complicated things for the smallest children because it's around them in the world all the time uh, and they can't be completely kept from it. And even if they could, what's the consequence of that? You protect your children and protect them and you pretend that the world is all lovely and sunny and fluffy and nothing, nothing bad ever happens. And then what? How long do you go on doing that for? Uh, do you do it till they're 12? Do you do it till they're 16? Do you do it till they're 18? And then suddenly open the door and show them what reality is like? It, it, it's, it, it, it's not really a viable, uh, a viable way to raise children. We have to have those conversations right from the start. Uh, and that's in more and more important because humanity is going to be entering a difficult period. And um, the children who are little now are going to be growing up in that difficult period. So it's very, very important that we as adults um, are brave enough to have those conversations. And children's books are one way to enable those conversations, to open them up and allow them to happen. Well, um, I would throw that question right back at you and say, what do you think? One of the most important things for me with my stories is that once they're out in the world, they have a life of their own. Um, I tend to write things that are open-ended so that my readers can um, to take the story for themselves, can uh, extend the story for themselves, can put themselves into the narrative. Uh, and that's a very, very important thing for me. And I also feel that it's something that's unique to the experience of reading. Um, a book is just paper and ink. It really only comes alive in the heart and the mind and the soul of the reader. And because every reader is different, that story comes alive in a different way with every, with every reader, every different reader. So my story exists differently in every single reader who reads it. Uh, and, uh, and part of that is leaving things open for you, readers, to decide for yourselves what happens next. For me, yes, I hope she is able to study. She's a very robust, resilient, resourceful child. Uh, and I'm sure that in my version of the story, she will grow up to be a robust, resilient and resourceful young woman with great empathy for other people in the world who have suffered in the same way that she has. Um, I hope that answers all your questions. Uh, thank you so much for answering them and for asking them. And, uh, and also thank you so much for taking this book to your heart. It's a very important book to me and it's life in the world um, gives me great comfort and pleasure. Thank you. Thank you.